you understand that no one is coming for your gaming systems with x86 chips and discrete GPUs, right? But you also need to acknowledge that current x86 design really isn't getting the job done for what I want. Hi, my name's Juan, and I talk way too much about mobile, so much so that for years I've been trying to encourage more folks to use the compute power in their phones to replace desktops and laptops. I even tried to get more system building nerds at Newegg to look at ARM compute a couple of years before Apple switched to ARM chips in the Macs. You're welcome, Apple users. I'm often met with gnashing of teeth from PC geeks, really worried about average consumers. I'm bringing up points like, what about high-end desktop gaming? What about corporate legacy software from the Windows XP days? Which kind of seems to miss the point of the practical daily computer needs of a modern tech consumer. Now with Qualcomm set to deliver some decent competition to Apple's M-series chips, I felt it was worth a quick look back at the state of Windows on ARM and what we've been able to do on older, less powerful ARM chips already. Now, I have crazy respect for the HEDT junkies that are looking to crush every conceivable benchmark at any power draw, but I've always been a performance per watt kind of guy. We're different kinds of geeks. I can totally admire an RTX 4090. That's a rad piece of tech. But I want an entire system that's still capable of editing 4K video on battery power that operates at maybe one-tenth the total power consumption of that 4090 under load. Because we kind of have that with phones. Editing youtuber -y videos or quickly cutting up some family videos, the newest chips from MediaTek and Qualcomm are able to outpace really good middle premium desktops and laptops, even with some expensive GPUs. And the phone might peak at like 10 or 12 watts while doing a heavy lifting task like 4K video editing. <laughs> Last time I'll mention phones again in this video, I promise, but I'm probably lying. When I get comments on my videos like, Windows on ARM will be worth it for the monies when it can do this kind of task. Or there's like skepticism that ARM chips can really do gaming. Cough, cough, Nintendo Switch, cough, cough. I feel a lot of techies have a lot of speculative opinions on things that already kind of exist and that they aren't very familiar with the options we have access to. As we look to the next phase of ARM computer chips, it's really useful to look at the previous generation of chips. I've spent most of my Windows on ARM time using the most recent Qualcomm Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3. Announced in 2021, we saw it in a handful of computers sold through 2022 and 2023. Specifically, I've used it mostly in the Microsoft Surface Pro 9 SQ3 and the Robo Encala convertible tablets, both fanless systems, tablets with snap-on blade keyboards, super thin, totally silent, and both featuring upgradable storage, which no iPad or Android tablet has. But the RAM on both is baked in and that can't be upgraded, kind of like a lot of our super thin and light notebooks. This chip, this Snapdragon, has been a really fun option that I don't think really got the attention it deserved, though I will admit at its initial launch, it was included in systems priced too high for its level of performance. We had just started getting these singular big cores in our phones, the Cortex X1. Now the 8CX Gen 3 was an eight core CPU design with four of those big X1 cores and then four little cores. But the four little cores were the A78s. The A78 was the big core we used in phones and tablets with chips like the Snapdragon 865, which even four years later is still a powerhouse chip for mobile consumers. See, I actually, I knew I couldn't promise I wouldn't keep talking about phone performance. I digress. This leads us to some interesting synthetic benchmarks for the older Snapdragon laptop chip. The 8CX Gen 3 was only pulling single core performance a little behind an 11th gen Intel Core i3, but it was delivering multi-core scores closer to the 11th gen Intel Core i5. And it was doing all this while using about half the power at idle. And of course, x86 software compatibility means higher performance in many applications for a Core i5, the peak power draw of an i5, often around 80% higher than that ARM chip. But on the whole, I felt pretty comfortable saying folks would experience roughly Core i3 performance, but with better battery life and no fan noise. And if you had apps and services optimized for ARM, you would get closer to that Core i5 tier of performance and still 
use less power overall. This brings up some interesting comparisons against iPads and Android tablets. Using a mobile OS on a larger surface means dealing with the mobile flavors of programs like Microsoft Office. But Office has native ARM support, so on Windows on ARM tablets, we get all the benefits of a more mobile power efficient chip and the proper software experience of a laptop grade operating system. Even down to the hardware, supporting an external display and presentation modes better than what we can do with phones and tablets. And honestly, as a work and entertainment tablet, that's gonna satisfy a lot of the folks out there who are working with web services and want a computer for their daily communication needs. The 8CX Gen 3 today is already a higher tier of performance for most people's needs, and it's another order of magnitude more powerful than what we give students using Chromebooks. That major stumble from Microsoft was pricing the performance of a Core i3 level device even higher than some of their Core i7 solutions. But later tablets, like the Robo Ancala, regularly sell in the ballpark of a nice iPad or a Galaxy Tab while still offering the complete Windows 11 experience. Covering office and productivity from there, it's really not difficult digging deeper to see where we might also use this kind of solution or what kinds of roadblocks we might run into. Content creation? Photo editing has been pretty solid lately. GIMP has quietly included ARM support for a while now. And after your initial setup, the program launches quickly and edits are fast so long as you're not working with a crazy number of layers. We're really held back more by RAM for bigger projects than outright compute power. So yes, a more powerful Intel or AMD machine can do a lot heavier lifting and use a ton of plugins and filters, but you wouldn't be doing that kind of work on an 11th gen Core i5 and expecting the highest level of performance experience. The app that slows me down a bit more is Affinity 2. Again, better optimized over the last couple updates, but it's slow to launch and raw files are so slow to load but I can get in there and do a quick punch up to a raw file when I need to. For both of these programs, I'm not doing any fancy hacking, <laughs> like emulation or looking for ARM specific builds or jumping through any hoops. I'm using the exact same installers as I used on my AMD workstation here by my feet. The pain point for me personally has been video editing. I live in DaVinci Resolve these days, and while it installs and it says the installation is complete, when you launch the program, it can't find OCL support for Qualcomm's GPU. I was hoping that the beta for Resolve 19 would maybe sneak in support for Windows on ARM, but that has not materialized yet. The rumor is we'll get ARM support from DaVinci officially when the laptops start shipping later this summer, and that will be one of the absolute first things I test on new laptops later this year. For now, you can use ClipChamp, which is mid for doing anything more than slamming a couple clips together, but I also had pretty good luck using KDEN Live on the Surface. It ran better on the Surface than it does on my Robo Ancala, but if you're desperate to cut up some 4K video, your timeline is gonna be a slideshow, but the rendering speeds aren't as bad as I was expecting. Moving on, browser support has improved tremendously over the last year. Now, I've stuck to Firefox and Edge, mostly because Google is obnoxious about trying to block any support for their services on Microsoft platforms, cough, cough, Windows phone, cough, cough. But the recent update to Chrome is now leapfrogging even native support for Microsoft Edge. It's silly, I'm using the older speedometer test here, but that's what we were shown during the Qualcomm event testing the new X Elite chip. And this also gives us a comparison against an Intel Core Ultra Ultra 7 155H. Again, keeping older 11th gen Intel in mind, this older Snapdragon is no slouch, and Chrome scores have almost doubled over the last two months. And of course we can talk about gaming. Again, no special Windows RT limited ARM versions of games. I'm using Steam and Epic and installing exactly the same way I would on my gaming PC or on my Steam Deck. And wouldn't you know it, this older ARM chip can just about hang with my Steam Deck. If you think the gaming experience on a Steam Deck is nifty, like I do, it's also really nice playing in that tier 
with a completely silent computer too. It's nice. Updates to games like Vampire Survivors have drastically improved late stage frame rates on my Steam Deck, but the Snapdragon has always been able to match 60 frames per second with no significant frame drops and at a higher resolution than the Steam Deck screen. Vampire Survivors might not be particularly exciting to you from a graphics conversation, but trust me, we're moving up from there. A game like Tetris Effect is deceptively heavy where you really don't ever want frame drops when sliding tetrominoes around and the Snapdragon can pace the Steam Deck at 720p regularly staying above 60 FPS. Less graphics intense titles like Shredder's Revenge and Dead Cells are all buttery smooth. No significant frame drops in games like Cuphead, so it's easy to keep your flow in those boss battles. My favorite older tower defense game, Defense Grid, is an absolute joy, especially with touchscreen support on a convertible tablet. It's on older console classics like Arkham Asylum, where we're starting to turn down quality settings, but the actual performance isn't too far from the systems that were current when that game originally shipped. You're gonna run into some games that just don't have support for specific libraries, like Bioshock. And while we can run at acceptable frame rates, obviously this is not playable. And since we're talking about little older ARM chips, I liken them to installing games on a Steam Deck. Of course, we do not have complete 100% support for every era of PC gaming on a Steam Deck running Linux, but the overall experience is good enough, focusing on efficient, portable gameplay that we can find a lot of games we like to play, and we expect that the compatibility with future titles will improve as more people are using this hardware. You see what I did there? Now, what I just said, replace Steam Deck for Windows on ARM, and it's pretty similar, because I saw a lot of people scoff at the gaming demo I showed for the new X Elite chip playing games like Control. There seems to be a lot of mental resistance to the idea that Control can play well at lower graphic settings on an ARM chip, or that maybe Qualcomm is using a double secret probation beta build of a game to enhance or cheat performance demonstrations. Well, if you've been paying attention to what we currently have for ARM computers, I think you'd have been more prepared for those kinds of performance demonstrations. Because I can sort of play control on my current Windows on ARM tablet right now. now I have to go into the options and turn everything everything to the lowest possible setting. Disable all aesthetic options, motion blur, chromatic aberration, and you can forget about ray tracing, and I have to swap it down to the lowest possible 16 by 9 resolution, but I can play control at a blistering 16 frames per second in action sequences. Impressively though, I can also explore the facility above 30 FPS when I'm not in combat. Would you really want to play control like that? Probably not, but it is actually more playable than you would expect. Again, we got to keep this all in perspective. Would you have had high hopes for an 11th gen Core i3 with integrated graphics performing significantly better? If you're a rational techie, no. No, you would not. Although this is one of the areas where a Steam Deck experience can outpace older Windows on ARM systems, especially if you can tack on FSR. That's where an AMD APU with active cooling really does step up. But no, I don't find it hard to believe that a newer Qualcomm chip with a beefier GPU in a fanless system can get us 1080p in control at 30 frames per second at low medium quality settings. We've been a lot closer to that than many techies realize. And as a quick aside, it's why I really hope that future versions of the Steam Deck or maybe a standalone VR headset from Valve might use Qualcomm parts instead of Intel and AMD. We'd need a lot of work on compatibility and emulation, but the performance per watt is kind of incredible for wearable, and portable machines. Look at what Nintendo has been able to eke out of an ancient Tegra SoC from Nvidia. Gamers should be really invested in what this hardware might bring over the next couple years. Back to Windows on ARM, one of the last points I hear brought up 
support for legacy software and hardware requiring specific drivers. Absolutely can be pain points, but I don't believe techies are properly predicting consumer reactions. I work with some specialty audio kit and it sucks. It's really obnoxious. I can't always get good support for Windows on ARM, but that means if I need to record an interview from a tablet, I obviously won't use a sound card or a recording interface that doesn't have the right drivers. Instead, I'll switch over to something like my Rode Wireless Go 2, where I get full support for 24-bit recording, the Rode Control app works on the tablet, Audacity sees it fine, and et voila, we have an excellent mobile high-quality audio recording solution. I had to adapt some of my behavior and equipment, but I arrived at a reasonably priced solution that does much better than meeting my lowest level recording needs. I know we like to write off average consumers as all being submoronic and incapable, but people are a lot more results oriented than techies give them credit for. Lately, it really seems to be the techies that can't handle a minor speed bump in the experience. I tried the one thing one time and it did not work. So no one should buy this until it perfectly meets my specific needs and does not require any change of behavior. And it's more powerful and it's cheaper and only spoon feed me exactly what I'm already familiar with in my brain. And then maybe I'll consider the potential of examining a switch. You gotta throw on a little snark sometimes. My mom had this old quilting software that looked like it was from the Windows 2000 days. Now my folks needed a new laptop and that exact program would not run on Windows on ARM but they also really wanted better battery life. So they opted for a new MacBook. Absolutely the right fit for their needs. We did not have a good solution in Windows land at the time. And my folks, they love their new laptop. And that Windows program still doesn't run natively on a Mac. My mom doesn't want to hassle with emulation. It was time to move on from that one older specific program. Not going to base an entire computer purchasing solution on that one older program. So yes, some folks are going to be resistant to change and some companies are going to have really difficult transitions, but we need to move forward at some point. We should not be holding back an entire market of computing products because of a diminishing collection of relevant legacy programs. But I digress again. The chip I've been demonstrating all of this on was announced back in 2021. If you didn't know, Windows on ARM could already do stuff like this well, and it has been for a couple of years now, I'd maybe question where you've been getting your tech news. They seem to have led you astray. <laughs> but seriously, we're at a turning point, and this is going to have huge ramifications for mobile compute products, new laptop and tablet form factors, mini desktops, and it's also gonna be a huge shot in the arm for Linux and Chromebooks, and I expect this evolution to also improve the next generation of AR and VR kit too. After we get through this initial launch, we should be looking forward to new solutions that cover even more computing tasks and a much higher degree of work when we're out in the field with more discrete systems in our homes. We should also be scrutinizing other products like tablets when a single laptop purchase can comfortably cover computing and entertainment tasks. Where's the value in a large screen mobile OS device? So I think this is already really fun. I've been using my Robo Ancala a lot over the last year. I'm very excited to see what we can do with a refresh and more performance. So of course I would like to hear from you. Are you excited for new laptops with ARM chips? Are you planning a laptop purchase this year like I am? What company do you think will deliver the most exciting flavor of Windows on ARM hardware? Drop some of those tasty hot takes down underneath this video. As always, thanks so much for all of the support lately. It's been absolutely amazing. Uh, those of you who are watching and sharing and subscribing, maybe you hit my home site, somegadgetguy.com, or maybe you've joined the list of names scrolling by on your screen from my Patreon, patreon.com slash somegadgetguy. This list is basically the coolest collection of tech pals in the universe. And literally none of my videos would be possible without their very generous support. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy basically everywhere. But these days I'm trying to spend more time on the Mastodons, a little less so on the Facebooks and the Instagrams and definitely not on the Twitters. And I will catch you all on the next video.